Um, hi there. Um, so in the previous videos, uh, we have introduced the idea of uh, complex analytical function. And uh, we also saw some uh, specific examples, um, for instance, the identity mapping uh, and its conjugate w is equal to z bar. Uh, and saw that uh, while the identity mapping uh, is complex analytic in terms of preserving angles between infinitesimal vectors emanating from some point z in the complex plane, uh, the, its conjugate z bar is not analytic uh, because although it preserves the magnitude of the angles, it reverses the signs. Uh, and so, uh, so, so, so we've seen a couple of examples of a function being analytic and a function which is not analytic. Um, now, uh, there's a very famous set of equations uh, known as the Cauchy-Riemann equations, um, which, uh, which provide us with uh, necessary and um, sufficient conditions to test for analyticity of uh, complex functions. Um, and, 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 and so in this video, let's work out these uh, relations. Um, now, there, there are a couple of different methods of deriving these equations, um, so, and we'll try and cover both of them. Uh, so so let, let's begin with one of these methods. Um, so, uh, so uh, in order to introduce these ideas, let's uh, let's first think about. Uh, let's say we have two scalar functions. Uh, let's say a function u, which is a function of x comma y, and we have another function v, which is a function of x comma y. And so these are two scalar fields over uh, two real variables x and y. Um, and let's and say we want to calculate the changes in u and v as we move from the point x to let's say the point x plus um, dx and from y to y plus dy. So we move infinitesimally in the xy Cartesian plane and then we want to calculate the change in these scalar functions u and v as we move in the xy plane. Um, so in order to see uh, what the changes are in u and v, um, so let's say we begin with u. So we have u or the change in u can be written as the, the value of u at x plus dx comma its value uh, comma y plus dy minus its value at x comma y right um, now to this expression uh, if we subtract and add ux so we have ux plus dx comma y plus dy and say we subtract u uh, at x uh, comma y plus dy and then we add the same quantity uh, u of uh, x comma y plus dy and we already have minus u of x comma y okay so uh, now let's look at uh, this expression um, this this particular expression together and let's look at these two terms together uh, which means that if you look at this expression uh, notice that x here is fixed whereas y changes from y to y plus d dy. So if we divide this by dy and multiply by dy, the, the expression within this uh, parenthesis is nothing but the, the change in u uh, with respect to change in y. So this is nothing but the partial derivative of u with respect to y. Likewise, if you look at this expression uh, and then we divide this by dx, and multiply by dx. Um, so let's multiply by dx. So this is du. Okay. So we divide by dx and multiply by dx here, and divide by dy and multiply by dy here. So if you do that here, uh, then notice that y plus dy is fixed here, whereas x changes from x to x plus dx. So the expression within the parenthesis is the the, the change in u with respect to change in x. So this is the partial derivative of u with respect to x. Whereas here, we have the partial derivative of u with respect to y. So this, the, the overall, the change in u can be written as uh, du dx times dx plus du dy times dy. Okay. And these uh, curly symbols denote partial derivatives, which means that if we have a function of more than one variable, um, this is the change in the function with respect to change in only one of the variables where, where we're keeping the other variables fixed, which is what we're doing here. So for instance, here we're keeping y plus uh, del y fixed and only changing x, whereas here we're uh, keeping x fixed and only changing y. Okay, uh, so in the same way, 
uh, if we sort of repeat this uh, uh, this process for to calculate the change in v, uh, uh, the the math will work out to be exactly the same. And what we'll find is that dv is uh, dv dx times dx plus dv dy times dy. And this is all at the limit that uh, dx goes to zero and dy goes to zero. So we can sort of replace this difference or finite difference with uh, derivatives. Okay, so um, now if you look at these two expressions, we can write this in the form of a matrix relationship uh, in a way that uh, we can write, we can compose a column vector out of du and dv and write this as du dv is equal to uh, a matrix which is composed of these partial derivatives. So we have du dx, um, du dy, then we have dv dx and dv dy times a column vector composed of dx and dy. Okay, so so we have a change in u du uh, is equal to or uh, the change in u uh, change in u and change in v can be expressed in the form of a matrix relationship uh, which looks like um, uh, a matrix composed of the partial derivatives du dx du dy dv dx dv dy times a column vector which describes the changes in x and y in the x y plane and this matrix is called the Jacobian matrix. And notice that this is the same uh, matrix that appears when we are sort of um, uh, when we're making when we are doing a change of variables, for instance. So, uh, so, so in some senses, we can think of complex functions. Uh, we haven't yet talked about complex functions, but um, um, uh, but we can think of complex functions as sort of inducing a change of variables because what we what we do is we move from the x y plane to a new set of variables u and v. Um, and and so uh, so for now, of course. Uh, uh, we are simply considering two scalar functions u and v and seeing what the changes are in these scalar functions u and v as we change x and y. Um, um, but uh, and, and this sort of leads us to this Jacobian matrix. Um, but, but, but so far we haven't introduced uh, in this picture um, the notion of complex analytical functions. And, and it turns out that uh, if within this sort of representation uh, we think of u and v as components of a complex analytical function, then, uh, then the Jacobian matrix will have to have some constraints. And those constraints are what are called the cauchy riemann conditions. Uh, so just to sort of reiterate, uh, we, we began with just two scalar functions u and v of two variables x and y. And then we are calculating the changes in u and v as we move in the xy two-dimensional xy plane. And we find that there is a matrix relationship uh, to calculate the changes in u and v uh, as we move uh, in the x y plane and, and that leads us to the Jacobian matrix and this appears quite generally when we are thinking of change of variables from x y to u v or we are just sort of finding out how, uh, how a scalar field u changes as we move in the x y plane. But now within this picture, let's think of u and v as representing components of uh, the real and imaginary components of a complex analytical function. And, and then let's see what happens, uh, how, how does that uh, sort of constraint uh, the description of this Jacobian matrix. Um, so, and in fact, this is the sort of uh, one of the key points where um, uh, even though we can think of complex functions or complex variables as two-dimensional vectors, uh, they have a certain more. They have they, they, since complex num complex uh, variables are also numbers, uh, and complex multiplication of two complex uh, numbers has certain features to it. Th this leads to uh, a certain constraints in in, um, in in terms of the kind of vectors. Uh, kind of a two-dimensional vector that a complex function represents. And, and those constraints are what uh, we are sort of trying to talk about in, in, in this uh, way when we talk about cauchy riemann conditions in particular. So, uh, so, 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 so the way we define complex analytical functions in a previous video was that it is that complex number with which, which, with which we multiply a vector dz in order to get the image vector dw. And so w prime z is the 
complex uh, is is the uh, the derivative of a complex function, uh, where the function is w uh, as a function of z. Um, now, so w prime z is some complex number. So let's just write w prime z as uh, a plus i b, where a and b are of course functions of the point z. Um, now we've already talked about matrix representation of complex numbers. And uh, and we'll see how that comes up comes about naturally in this description. So uh, so let's first write down z as x plus i y, uh, and therefore d z uh, therefore d z will be d x plus i times t y. Uh, in the same way, if we write w, which is the complex function, as u plus i b, then dw can be written as du plus i times dv okay uh, and we, we have already chosen to represent w prime z which will be some complex number as a plus i b uh, so if we multiply w prime z with dz uh, what let's see what we get so this is dz and this is dw so let's derive what dw is when we multiply dz with a plus ib. So we have dz and then we multiply it by a plus ib which is w prime z and this should give us dw which is du plus i times dv. So if we multiply this the real part will be a times dx minus b times dy plus i times uh, a times uh, dy uh, minus uh, sorry plus b times dx okay and that is equal to du plus i times dv okay so the real part, uh, the change in the real part u uh, du is a times dx minus b times dy and the change in the imaginary part which is dv um, is uh, a times dy plus b times dx. And we can again write this in the form of a relationship which, um, which, is, which is of the form of matrix, uh, product of a matrix with a column vector. Um, and the way to do that is um, to, to simply define, to simply write du and dv as uh, du which is the real part and dv is equal to uh, a uh, minus b and then b a times dx and dy Okay, so this gives us du is a times dx minus b times dy, which is what we worked out uh, just, just a moment ago, and dv as b times dx plus a times dy. Okay, so uh, on the first line here, we have uh, a general relationship for a change of variables or for two scalar functions, u and v, as a function of x and y, and if we move x and y infinitesimally by an amount dx and dy, then the infinitesimal changes in u and v are given by this uh, relationship where this is the Jacobian matrix. And, and in the second line, uh, we are focused specifically on complex analytical functions, uh, which gives us another sort of relationship uh, where du and dv have to, have to be obtained uh, through a matrix uh, of the form a minus b, b a times the column vector dx dy. Now, if these u and v represent the same functions, uh, then, it, then we must have these two matrices, matrices equal to each other, right? So the Jacobian matrix must have a form which looks like this matrix, which means that the diagonal entry should be same and the off-diagonal entry should be negatives of each other. And let's see what that gives us. So that gives us A should be equal to du dx if we compare the two matrices, matrices. And that should be equal to dv dy. and b should be equal to dv dx which should be equal to minus du dy
And these relationship between uh, the partial derivatives, these two relationships are precisely what are called the Cauchy-Riemann equations. And notice how the matrix representation of the complex number W prime Z emerges naturally in this description. Uh, because for a complex number of the form A plus IB, we know that its matrix representation has to have the form that the diagonal entries are same, equal to A, and the off diagonal ele elements are negatives of each other, which is the imaginary part of the complex number. Um, now, it turns out that these two relationships, uh, so if we are to check whether a given complex function is analytic or not, uh, we can compute the partial derivatives of u with respect to x and v with respect to y and see whether they are equal or not. Similarly, we compute the partial derivative of v with respect to x and u with respect to y and see if they are negatives of each other. If these derivatives are non-zero and they exist, they are well defined uh, at the point x, comma, y and these relationships are satisfied, uh, then that gives us a necessary and sufficient condition for the function um, w, which is u plus iv, to be complex analytic. Um, not only this, in fact, uh, from here, we also can calculate what the derivative of the function is, uh, because we know that the derivative dw dz is w prime z, which is a plus ib. And we know that a is du dx plus i times b, b is dv dx. So the derivative of the function is can be is actually du dx plus i times dv dx or which is equivalent to dv dy minus i times du dy. So, um, so once we have calculated these partial derivatives, we have also we, we, we also know what the derivative of the complex function with respect to z is. And it, it's actually du dx plus i times dv dx or dv dy minus i times du dy. Um, so, uh, so, so these are actually, uh, these Cauchy-Riemann conditions are actually of fundamental importance in the study of complex functions because uh, a, a large class of, or, or a large part of the study of complex functions is actually devoted to the study of analytical functions. And these form really the, the, the the, the really the fundamental ideas behind uh, complex analytical functions. Um, so, uh, but this, this this is one of the ways of deriving these conditions. There's another way, and we'll talk about that in a future video. Um, and we'll also try and work out. Uh, we will also talk about more complex mappings and see, uh, and, and particular analytical mappings and different kinds of analytical mappings. We'll explicit, explicitly check these conditions um, and uh, talk uh, more about their uses. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I hope uh, this was of some use and um, see you soon with uh, more videos. Thanks.